So welcome. <coughs> this is where everybody politely comes to a quiet repose. As I introduce our speaker, welcome to the last lecture of this term in the Edmund J. Safra Center for, Ex Center for Ethics series on institutional corruption. My name is Lawrence Lessig, director of the center and a professor at the law school. I'm very happy to welcome Norm Ornstein to deliver this final lecture based, one can only hope, on his incredible new book with Tom Mann, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. Um, now, Norm Ornstein is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute with Tom Mann. He directs the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan, receiving his PhD in 1974, and he serves on the board of Why Tuesday, a nonprofit organization pushing America to exa ask exactly why elections are held on Tuesday, presumably to get a different answer to that question than Tuesday provides. He also serves as the advisory board of a number of organizations, including the Future of American Democracy Foundation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan foundation that, in partnership with Yale University Press and the Yale Center for International and Area Studies, is dedicated to research and education aimed at renewing and sustaining the historic vision of American democracy. Now, the particularly interesting bit for me in that final description, in light of his most recent book, is the nonpartisan term. For as I read Mann and Ornstein's book, I was struck with uh, what I think we should call its situational bravery. Because if you've read the book or heard Norm in any number of popular uh, venues describing its conclusion, you'll know that, uh, that Norm and Tom attribute uh, disproportionate responsibility for Congress's current mess to the Republicans. And while blaming one party or the other doesn't seem like such a difficult utterance to make, after all, we've just had a $6 billion election where both sides made exactly that claim about the other side, I think it's important for all of us to recognize just how difficult an utterance it is for them to make. For Mann and Ornstein are the deans of congressional study, Perhaps more than anyone else, they have spent their lives understanding the institution and its flaws and working closely with members of both parties to try to remedy those flaws. In that practice, they must, like any scholar, pursue the truth. But in that practice as well, they must come to practice a certain sort of rhetorical discipline. Practitioners must be balanced or, quote, nonpartisan, as the Future of American Democracy Foundation is. So what do you do if you find the output of one practice, the truth-seeking practice, conflicts with the constraint of the other practice, the nonpartisanship practice? Do you fudge the truth to keep faith with the institutional frame of nonpartisanship? Or do you utter the truth and accept the cost that such a truth will impose on you given your frame, your institutional frame of nonpartisanship? So for those who have watched the series of lectures that we've uh, had in this ethics center over the past three years, this will seem a familiar trade-off. For institutional corruption invokes precisely such a conflict, even if within very different contexts. And so it's perfectly fitting for us to welcome Norm Ornstein here to this series about institutional corruption, practiced as he is in the difficult moral struggle that this issue presents, and yet on the side we hope we all would be if we all were to face the exact same struggle. Now, we had originally scheduled this event for last Thursday. We had to move it so Mr. Ornstein could accept the honor of being selected by foreign policy as one of its 2012 top 100 global thinkers for diagnosing America's political dysfunction. Let us honor Mr. Ornstein as well, not only for that diagnosis, but for a practice that demonstrates even more clearly a perhaps deeper cause of America's political dysfunction, the unwillingness to state the truth regardless of institutional consequence. Thank you very much, Mr. Ornstein, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Lessig. I could listen to you introduce me all day long. Uh, <laughs> And thanks for mentioning the book, which, by the way, makes a great holiday gift. Uh, 
Uh, and I would also plug uh, Larry Lessig's book, Republic Lost, which is itself a brave uh, and passionate uh, book, uh, which uh, to anybody who reads it will also bring us to the barricades to try and do something uh, about the mess we're in. Uh, we've just been through a very interesting election. We perhaps saw the bookend put on it last week as President Obama had Mitt Romney over for lunch. At the end, he suggested that they split the bill. He'd pay 47% and <laughs> Romney would pay the rest. Um, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we had another uh, seminal event. It was the 40th anniversary of Sesame Street. I called Big Bird and uh, congratulated him. He said uh, it was a big day, but nowhere near as big as November the 6th. He had had a near-death experience uh, leading into the election. And another uh, seminal event occurred uh, just a few days ago when Florida finished its vote count. Uh, and actually, uh, just uh, last Thursday, uh, they found 596 votes for Al Gore in an attic. Uh, so. <laughs> Two days after the election, I was in Erie, Pennsylvania, giving a lecture, and I succeeded uh, Carl Rove, uh, who was appropriately downcast. I said, I've got good news for you, Carl. I've uh, looked into it, and it turns out depression is fully covered under Obamacare, so <laughs> you'll be okay. A beautiful day uh, here. Actually, I was uh, down south two days ago, uh, where it was 82 and foggy, uh, just like Clint Eastwood. Uh, and that, of course, <laughs> brings us back to uh, one of the most interesting landmarks of the election campaign, uh, Eastwood's appearance at the Republican convention uh, in uh, Tampa, uh, which was a convention, of course, I was just reflecting back on uh, the arc of the last year. Uh, that was a convention dominated by the weather, which has uh, become a big uh, topic uh, in so many ways in this election. Um, Hurricane Isaac at that point. Uh, the weather was uh, severe enough and the forecast severe enough that Donald Trump canceled his uh, ballyhooed appearance at the convention. Nobody ever talks about the good things that can come with hurricanes. Uh, but my favorite moment came when Herman Cain was interviewed uh, about the weather and he was asked if he remembered Katrina and he said, I've never met her, I don't know her, there's, <laughs> there's no proof anywhere. Uh, I went from there to uh, Charlotte, uh, the Democratic Convention, and uh, the highlight for me there was uh, picking up a campaign button. I love the campaign buttons. They often signify different things. So I found a big button with a picture of Jenna Jameson uh, on it. Now, most of you probably don't know who Jenna Jameson is. I see there's somebody who does. She is the most prominent porn star in America, and she had endorsed Mitt Romney, saying, I'm rich, so I'm voting for Romney. And the button was, porn stars for Romney. And I picked up the button and I thought, the Democrats are losing the porn star vote. This never would have happened under Bill Clinton. Uh, so I like to get you laughing because it's all downhill uh, from this point on. Um, let me just start with the broader observation. Uh, Tom Mann and I came to Washington together in the fall of 1969. And uh, pretty much since that point, with uh, brief interludes for both of us, uh, we have been immersed in uh, the politics and policy-making processes at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue uh, now for 43 years. And we've never seen it this dysfunctional. Uh, and it's been plenty dysfunctional in the past. Now, I gave the book the title, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, because it never looks good. It's not designed to look good. Uh, the framers understood full well that the process of making policy uh, was going to be contentious and cantankerous and at times vicious. You're bringing together people with vastly different interests from vastly different backgrounds and getting them to agree to things would not be easy. Uh, and they understood that this is in some ways a, a fundamental element of human nature, a challenge of human nature. Nobody likes to accept the certainty of short-term pain for the promise of long-term benefit or gain. Actually, I was reflecting on this uh, a couple of months ago on a Sunday evening as I was preparing for my colonoscopy the next uh, morning. And uh, those of you who've been there know that uh, the typical uh, response uh, most of the evening is to say out loud, why am I doing this? 
<laughs> frequently uh, through what is a very unpleasant evening. And of course, I did it not just because I accepted the authority of my gastroenterologist, who's a good one, but the entire scientific community that convinced me that accepting the enormous discomfort uh, that went into this process was worth it because it would bring benefit to me and potentially to my children uh, by extending my life uh, sometime down the road. It's easy to accept the authority of scientific figures. It's not easy to accept the authority of political figures. So designing a political process where people are going to be willing across disparate uh, uh, individuals and communities to accept those policy decisions is not an easy thing to do. And they reflected a lot on what kind of system would work best in the extended republic uh, that they saw out there. People coming from these vastly different areas, living dramatically different lives, reflecting very different communities, but extending you know, this territory that was so much smaller than what we have now, but where it would take weeks to go from uh, Boston to New York, uh, or from New York to Philadelphia, uh, that uh, living in remote rural areas where you might literally not see another human being for months all the way to incredibly densely packed urban areas, and decided that the parliamentary model that they knew about just wasn't going to work in a system such as ours. One where you would have a majority party that would join together and act, and a minority that would vociferously oppose but wouldn't block, couldn't block those actions, a culture that would accept the legitimacy of those actions, even if they disapproved mightily because they knew that uh, there would be uh, a chance within two, three, four, or five years to uh, hold them accountable one way or the other. They needed something different, and they created very deliberately a Congress, which comes from the Latin word meaning to come together, and not a parliament, which comes from the French word meaning to speak. Uh, in a parliamentary system, the parliament is really the agent of the government. They thought we need to bring people from these disparate areas together to meet face to face, debate, deliberate, put yourselves in others' shoes, and over a period of time, come to some kind of consensus. But that was not going to be an easy thing to do. And uh, through the 43 years uh, that we have been in Washington and experiencing this process, it is something that was maddening at times and frustrating at other times. Uh, and uh, never pretty uh, along the way. But this is simply worse. It's worse than going through the agonies of the Vietnam War with a deeply divided political arena and a deeply divided country. Worse than going through the impeachment of Richard Nixon. And for those who were around at that time uh, and who then saw the relative uh, indifference when we went through the impeachment with Bill Clinton, we had no idea whether the republic would survive that first impeachment, whether there would be a coup, uh, what would happen. Getting through it, as we did, in the end, because you had members of both parties come together and convince the president to step aside before it all came apart, actually made it, ironically, made it that much easier to do it again uh, a little bit later in the future. Those were tough times. But this is different. And in effect, what we have been seeing over the last few years some of it with the seeds that were planted in dramatic shifts, regional and otherwise, in the country going back 40 and 50 years, that moved our parties in very different directions and moved them to a point where they've become much, much more homogeneous in character and moved distinctly further apart, uh, is they've become like parliamentary parties and increasingly began to act like parliamentary parties in a system and a culture that simply won't tolerate it. But the second part uh, of what we have seen uh, is one that Professor Lessig referred to, which is that as the parties have polarized and become characteristically like parliamentary parties, which is vehemently oppositional in nature, it has not been symmetric polarization. Um, and you know, if you use, when I, uh, a couple of decades ago, would uh, teach classes uh, about Congress, and I tried to describe the parties and the dynamics in Congress, I would use this analogy. I would say, imagine if you took all the members of Congress, put them on buses, and drove them a mile and a half due east of the Capitol to what used to be our football stadium, RFK Stadium, told them to go down on the field and place themselves where their worldview, their general orientation would make them feel most comfortable, 
and we went up to the press box and looked down, we would see a visual representation of the bell curve, a normal distribution. The vast majority of members congregated somewhere near the midfield stripe, a lot of admixture between the two. But if you did that now, performed the same exercise, repainted the football lines on the field before you took them over to RFK, from the press box, you would see on one side of the field, Democrats with a handful near the midfield area, quite a lot around the 30 or 25 yard line, a few moving down uh, towards the end of the field, and the Republicans almost all uh, behind their own goalpost, with not a few, not a few floating in the Anacostia River nearby. Uh, and it's a very real change. When we sat down to write this book, um, as Larry said, that's not an easy thing to point out in a lot of ways. And one of the things that's interesting is that in all of the wonderful political science work that's been done in mapping ideology and polarization in Congress, and you look at all that's been written about it, they don't mention parties. Uh, they don't talk about these differences because it's not polite and it's a little tricky to do that. So when we set about to write this book, and the motivation for the book was uh, an editor named Tim Bartlett, who I just see is here, uh, who had worked on the previous book that we'd done, The Broken Branch, and said it was time to do a book, and we thought, uh, we have the time for it, we want it, and we decided we had something that needed to be said, and uh, that, you know, you know, a little self-serving, I'll put it, uh, we had built political capital or capital up, intellectual capital, over 40 plus years as being uh, people who cared about the political process in Congress, called it as we saw them. We had no ideological agenda. We had no partisan agenda. We cast blame where it was deserved and gave praise where it, it was deserved. Um, and what's the capital for if not to spend it? When uh, the problems are getting much more severe in terms of uh, being able to get out of the boxes that we're in and the larger problems facing the society, policy problems and social problems, short and long term, are growing more acute. And the mismatch now was just not working and wasn't going to work. And frankly, we also were motivated to do it because of a frustration that I will tell you continues with modest abatement uh, since this book came out. Uh, with a press corps that has, for a variety of reasons, deeply inculcated into its own norms the idea of false equivalence. And that every story has to be on the one hand, on the other hand, or they all do it, um, or just simply the broader notion, uh, our job is to report both sides of the story. And on television, where for an even longer period of time, it has been uh, that we want our viewers to see this as being like the law, where you have advocates for each side and our viewers are the jury and they can determine the truth. And so you put on either somebody from way off on the left against somebody from way off on the right arguing with each other, or somebody who spins madly for one side and spins for the other, the Carvel madeline model, even better if they're married to each other. Uh, <laughs> and that the truth will out, when of course it does nothing of the sort. It either convinces people that there is no middle, or it convinces them that there's no honest person out there. They're all a bunch of cynics just saying whatever is necessary uh, to uh, advance their own causes, and uh, often their own causes are making a bundle of money for themselves uh, or for others that they represent, but it does no service to the public uh, as a whole. And uh, <clears throat> in the course of uh, preparing this book, one of the things that really moved me or motivated me is there was a story in the Washington Post by a couple of very good reporters, generally, uh, back around the time that um, Eric Cantor, uh, the House Majority Leader, uh, weather rearing its ugly head again, uh, after we had had uh, the earthquake uh, in the Northeast uh, and another set of devastating hurricanes, decided that for the first time ever, he was going to insist that disaster relief uh, uh, that went to one part of the country be offset by a cut in spending elsewhere, which he said could come from other disaster relief or from food stamps or wherever you want. 
So people in the Midwest who've been devastated by tornadoes and floods were either going to lose their money uh, to pay for the Northeast, or people on food stamps with unemployment levels rising were going to have to do without. And we'd never done it that way before. And Democrats said, you know, you're changing the rules in the middle of the game. We're not going to go along with that. So the bottom line is the story said, Democrats picked a fight. And I wrote a, a little piece in the New Republic saying, uh, let's imagine that uh, these reporters were approached in the newsroom by the publisher and told, ordered, that they would slant a story on behalf of an advertiser. And they refused and uh, went out on strike. And the story that emerged was, reporters pick a fight with publisher. Uh, did that accurately reflect what was going on? And uh, I got a, a, a snippy uh, email from another veteran Washington Post reporter saying, you just don't understand. Our job is to report both sides of the story. And I wrote back and said, so if there's a hit and run accident, you're going to report first that the hit and run driver said, it's not my fault. The idiot stepped into the crosswalk uh, at, with an equal footing uh, with maybe even more because the victim is comatose. And so it's no comment coming from the other side. <laughs> Uh, that just doesn't make any sense uh, to me, and it still doesn't. And the fact is, if we're going to have a system that holds people accountable, they have to know who's responsible for the pathologies in the political process, and that has not been happening. And I take small pride that uh, since the book came out, and the, actually uh, one of the things that really uh, enabled this book to sell very well was uh, an article that appeared the day before the official publication date in the Washington Post Outlook section that uh, the editor there um, uh, uh, titled, let's just say it, the Republicans are the problem, um, which uh, did more for me than the editor in the New York Times uh, who said to Mitt Romney, how about let Detroit go bankrupt? Uh, <laughs> that title got people's attention, but in the wrong way. And this title got people's attention and made a lot of unhappy uh, <coughs> unhappy Republicans uh, out there, some of whom still don't speak uh, to me, but it, it uh, got the attention of the press corps because it chastised the press corps in, the, in these lines. And there have been conversations going on since. But as you see, if you read the papers uh, or watch the news coverage, not nearly enough has changed. And we see this even now as we're going through these uh, negotiations uh, using the term loosely, uh, over the fiscal cliff uh, and what gets reported. Now, that's a, a little bit, but only a little bit of an aside. And let me get back to uh, the major uh, pathologies here. So if you have a political system that is not designed to have parliamentary parties and a culture that doesn't accept, even when a majority is able to act, the legitimacy of those actions uh, as you do automatically uh, in a parliamentary system, things don't function very well. We began to see this operate uh, in the first two years of the Clinton administration when uh, Newt Gingrich engineered it so that Republicans would vote in unison against uh, the Clinton initiatives. Uh, and it worked like a charm with the midterm elections in 1994. Uh, in this instance, Clinton had robust majorities uh, of his own party in both houses of Congress. But after uh, 38 years consecutive in the majority, they didn't listen to presidents. Uh, their majority they saw was permanent. Presidents come and go, whatever the party may be. He couldn't keep his own party together in the face of unified Republican opposition, parliamentary minority opposition. And it took him eight months to get his economic plan passed by one vote in each house, it looked more like a defeat than a victory, and certainly not the kind of early victory that a president hopes will provide a springboard to future things. And then, of course, we moved on from there to the debacle over his health care plan. And Republicans swept into majorities in both houses as a consequence of that. But we saw it ratcheted up dramatically with Obama's presidency. So if you have these parliamentary-style parties, even so, if you can keep your majority together, presumably you can act and make things happen. And the fact is, as Obama came in with numbers just a little bit better than what Clinton had, but a different Democratic Party that could unite together, 
he could actually have hopes of getting some things done. But something else changed from the Clinton years that added to the difficulties in the system. And that was, uh, it was no longer enough to have unified majorities in the House and Senate with a president. You needed 60 votes for everything in the Senate. The use of the filibuster, the misuse of the filibuster, in ways that had never been contemplated or applied before in the history of the country, raising the bar on routine issues as well as on hotly contested ones, and doing it as a party strategy. If you think back to big filibusters in the past, they were factional in nature, or they were driven by rogue individuals or small groups, the factional, of course, being the civil rights uh, uh, filibusters that were led by Southern Democrats, but opposed by uh, as many Republicans as Northern Democrats. This was a unified party attempt at filibuster and a process that was dominated by a strategy intended to delegitimize any actions that were taken over the hurdles posed by unified minority opposition and by filibusters. And what we saw was two years at the beginning of the Obama administration where the outputs were quite extraordinary in terms of the breadth and depth uh, and importance of what was done from a stimulus package that, if you read the wonderful book by Michael Grunwald, The New New Deal, um, was uh, actually a package of very substantial substantive changes that itself would have been an impressive set of outputs for uh, a, a presidency, followed by the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Dodd-Frank legislation, throw in the Lilly Ledbetter credit card reform and a whole series of other things. But unlike a parliamentary system, half the country ended up seeing those actions as illegitimate. And there were moves made after they were enacted into law to delegitimize them and keep them from being implemented. And that was followed by the same work like a charm midterm election that gave Republicans the majority in the House and uh, cut significantly Democratic numbers in the Senate. And then we had the true nightmare of a parliamentary minority uh, in a uh, presidential system such as ours, which is the closest you can get to gridlock. And the fact is that the outputs of the uh, 112th Congress in uh, numbers were pathetic compared to any other Congress in the last 60 years. Now, admittedly, numbers alone don't tell the story. It's qual uh, quality as much as quantity. Um, we've been hearing a lot of late about the uh, famous do-nothing Republican 80th Congress that Harry Truman ran against so successfully, which did not have a huge number of outputs. Um, and it's become defined forever as the do-nothing Congress. But the fact is it gave us the Marshall Plan. Uh, what I would argue is one of the five or six most significant uh, steps of the 20th century. And uh, any Congress that did a Marshall Plan could do one bill, go home and be historic. This Congress's equivalent of the Marshall Plan was the debt limit debacle that resulted in the first downgrade in American credit in uh, history. And uh, almost nothing else of great significance. The only legislative actions taken that were uh, of importance were a transportation bill that got delayed for many months through a crucial uh, uh, construction season, an FAA authorization bill that, if you remember back to that time, was held up and actually forced a shutdown of much of the FAA at a time that cost uh, at least 70,000 construction jobs uh, and delayed the implementation of the 21st century air traffic control uh, system that's been uh, waiting for a long time. Not much else. Voters had a chance to offer their viewpoint, but we don't have that clear-cut level of accountability. Uh, and, of course, water's muddied even more by the money system that I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, and uh, we ended up with not a status quo election, as uh, uh, John Boehner uh, is now trying to call it, but one that didn't change the power allotments in the system. And now we're waiting to see if uh, anything emerges from this election that brings about a significant change. And the prospects are not wonderful, uh, even though uh, I think there has been uh, a shockwave through uh, Republican circles uh, from all of this, a shockwave uh, amplified by what was the still puzzling and rather remarkable reality that it wasn't just a few of the cranks and spinners like Dick Morris 
um, or Karl Rove, who were uh, saying that they were sure that uh, Romney would win in a walk. And as Dick Morris uh, uh, admitted later, uh, he didn't really believe it. He was just saying it because uh, his team was demoralized and he wanted to uh, perk him up. Uh, so the independent analyst uh, talked about his team. Uh, but it was also something that was believed by Romney's own pollsters and his consultants and Romney himself right up until uh, fairly late onto election eve. If you go into an election thinking, you know, the odds may be stacked a little bit against us as an incumbent president, um, country's pretty evenly divided, we could lose this thing, we might win. That's one thing. If you're sure you're going to win and you not only lose but lose pretty handily, you got to start to think about what's been going on here. And there is some rethinking going on, and there are some people in Republican and conservative ranks, people like Ramesh Panuru of National Review, who are now saying it's not just uh, one little problem. It's not just, as uh, Sean Hannity or Charles Krauthammer have said, you know, all we got to do is get an immigration bill through change amnesty from a four-letter word to a seven-letter word, flip that switch, and we don't have to do anything else. But something more fundamental is going on here. But it's fairly clear that that ferment occupies a tiny corner of uh, the intellectual right and has had almost no impact on the politicians on the ground or anywhere else. And you see now, as we go through these torturous negotiations, uh, over the, the, the fiscal cliff and the larger questions that we have to deal with uh, on uh, uh, our uh, debt problems looking down the road and about the role uh, of uh, government. And you see in the last few days, after a few people uh, seemingly courageously stepped up and said, I'm more committed to the future of the country than to what Grover Norquist said. That was Saxby Shambliss, who the next day got on the phone for a long conversation with Grover Norquist which he, uh, for which he very nicely offered a transcript afterwards uh, in which uh, groveling ensued, uh, shall we say. And the same is true of others. And uh, the fact is, uh, if you're faced with the prospect as a member of Congress, that if you lift your head out of the foxhole, the Club for Growth has a $3 million bounty waiting to put down for anybody who will shoot your head off. Or if you are in the Senate, far more than that, and they've already indicated that Lindsey Graham is their number one target, whatever it takes to knock him off, Saxby Shambliss up in the same year, and Mitch McConnell and uh, John Cornyn, the number one and number two Republican leaders, also facing the prospect of primaries. And an election system in which the money that can be thrown in to defeat you in a primary, in an election process where a sliver of voters will turn out and make that difference, and if you're Mitch McConnell, remembering that probably three years ago we all would have said he is the uh, universally acknowledged king of the Republican Party in Kentucky, and then used all of his forces to try to block Rand Paul from winning the Republican nomination, and now has Rand Paul in the Senate. And if you're John Cornyn, as you sat there and watched as the very conservative and uh, most powerful political figure in the state, perhaps, David Dewhurst, the lieutenant governor, ran for the Senate and was challenged by Ted Cruz as being too moderate. And you just sat by and watched while Ted Cruz stomped Dewhurst from one end of the state to the other. Uh, being an establishment Republican in Texas may not serve you too well either it's going to be an uphill battle to try and move just in this one area to get a resolution that's a reasonably good one and then move on. Eventually something will happen, but it reminds us that one election in this process, even looking at the last three before this, three waves in a row before we hit this, have not been enough to leach the pathologies out of the system. And indeed, uh, in some respects, they're going to get worse before they uh, get better. And even if you have leaders who'd like to move a little bit in the opposite direction, uh, you can see how difficult that is. When John Boehner first knew he was going to become speaker and choked up uh, immediately um, because he didn't 
actually really think that could happen. You may recall that the first speech he gave was to his colleagues, especially the new ones coming in in 2010, and he said, you know, we're going to be in the majority. We're going to share some of the responsibility for governing. That means we've got to be grown-ups. We're going to have to swallow hard and do some things we don't want to do. And that starts with the debt limit. Nobody wants to vote for it, but now we've got to suck it up. And of course, you saw what happened. And now you see what happens to leaders in this system as we approach another debt limit vote. And the first thing John Boehner said before the election was, well, we're going to use this as another hostage taking uh, uh, opportunity. So he's gone from being the grown up to uh, being the one to boil the oil uh, and uh, grab uh, the uh, uh, tar and feathers uh, to uh, try and uh, bring about uh, bad things in the political arena because the leadership now consists of looking where the mob is going and trying to run a little bit faster to get out in front of them. So this is not a good way to run a political system. It's not a good way to deal with immediate crises. It is not a good way uh, to deal with some of the larger problems that we face. And basically what's happened is that uh, tribalism has overtaken simple partisanship. That ideological differences, sharp as they are, are in most of these instances fairly easy to bring together with uh, uh, pragmatic solutions. You can see with the fiscal cliff when every group that spans the spectrum from Simpson Bowles to Rivlin Domenici to the Gang of Six comes up with the same template, but you can't reach that template. Uh, that, uh, and where we had uh, bipartisan efforts on immigration, on a whole range of issues, becomes tribal when you say, if you're for it, we're against it, even if we were for it yesterday. Let me just mention an example or two, and then I want to turn to, uh, for a, a few minutes, to. Uh, some of the ways we might, uh, we might deal with this. Uh, I'll just give one example. Um, back in 2010, uh, we had a commendable bipartisan uh, effort to deal with our debt problem, uh, at least uh, to create a structural means to do so. Conservative Republican Judd Gregg uh, of New Hampshire joined together with moderate Democrat Ken Conrad to propose a congressional commission with teeth that would uh, have an opportunity to come up with a plan to deal with the debt, uh, have a guaranteed expedited set of up or down votes in the House or Senate. And for a year and a half, there wasn't a day that went by, uh, 2009 I should say, when Mitch McConnell didn't either take to the floor or go on television or give a speech saying, the Greg Conrad Commission, that's the way to go. If we could just get the Greg Conrad Commission, we could deal with this problem, we could bridge our differences. If only President Obama would support this, we could move on it. Then in 2010, President Obama supported it. And a couple of months later, the Senate voted on it. It got 53 votes for it. But it was filibustered, died on a filibuster. Seven original Republican co-sponsors of it voted against their own bill and filibustered it, as did Mitch McConnell. One reason, he's for it, then we must be against it. You can't operate a political system that way and be able to solve uh, problems. Now, it's all exacerbated by what's become a building problem of money in the process, a problem heralded so well by the book by Bob Kaiser, Too Damn Much Money, by the reality that I've seen in Washington over 40 years where you have lawyers, lobbyists, public relations figures making massive sums of money, most of them coming out of the political arena and getting four, five, 10, or 20 times what they made when they were uh, staffers or members, uh, that is simply a corrupting process. And then when you look at what's happened with the campaign system, as politics have become more tribal as the permanent campaign has taken over, and what's been unleashed not just by Citizens United, but by the pathologies of the Federal Election Commission, the failures of the Internal Revenue Service, and the decisions made since Citizens United, the progeny that have come out, like speech now, is a system where even if we began to find ways to get different people coming into the process, a different mindset, there is so much out there that pulls them in a different uh, direction. And Professor Lessig is right that whatever else we do, whatever structural changes we manage to find, 
whether there are are, they are ways of enlarging the electorate to move this process from having the overweening influence of a small number of those at the extremes. And we have all kinds of suggestions for doing that. Or overcoming by a rules change the way the filibuster is now being used. It's not really a rules problem. The rule has been the same since 1975. It's the practice over the last five years. But you're not going to change the culture that brings about that practice without changing the rules. If all of those things are done and we don't do anything about money in the system, uh, we're still going to have um, a very, very sick process that will leave us uh, hampered in any ability that we have to move forward uh, in the nation as a whole. And I would just end by saying I'm less troubled by what this means in a presidential election process as we saw this last time. Um, presidential candidates, for the most part, can take care of themselves. They have enough resources, there's enough public attention focused on them. It matters more when you get to the Senate and the House, but matters even more when you start to move down to the state level. And we've seen in the last couple of months, uh, last few months, just before the election I spoke in Kansas, the Koch brothers bought Kansas for about $3 million. They went into primaries and basically knocked out all the moderate Republicans so that Governor Brownback could have a majority of people who are now going to give us, in Newt Gingrich's term, right-wing uh, social experimentation uh, in the state. They did the same thing this last time in Arkansas. It's cheap. Most of these uh, local races, state legislative races, they're not used to having any campaign run against them. Fifty or $100,000 can make a huge difference. And it matters even more with judicial elections, um, where we're going to see a level of corruption that troubles me more than anything else right now. You look at the Arab Spring, you look at what happened in Eastern Europe, you look at China and all around the world, nothing is more fundamental to a democratic political process than an independent judiciary. And you get the ability, and it's not just Citizens United, in fact, it's a whole series of, uh, of state decisions that James Bopp has managed to engineer that basically makes judicial elections just like all others. All this money coming in, and where is a judge going to raise money uh, from the people who practice in front of him or her? Uh, and if you know that somebody may be coming after you with millions of dollars, whether it's a retention election just to knock you out uh, or uh, a contest, because of a decision you are about to make, you may think twice about the decision that you're making. This is a completely unhealthy process. All of the other changes, some of them built into a culture that now has lying as something that is, uh, uh, has, brings no approbation or punishment to it. If you get caught in a lie, you double down on it and you get your own cable television show or you become a major political figure. You can even run for president. Um, uh, a media that is not only becoming increasingly tribal itself, but that has uh, the inability to uh, actually report the truth uh, compared to uh, covering your own bases because you don't want to be attacked for being uh, biased one way or the other. Uh, all of those things, if we can change them, are still going to leave us in a hole unless we deal with this larger problem. So my one stop, one solution to this is a generous retirement fund for Justice Anthony Kennedy. And that may be a good note in which to uh, stop and uh, take some questions or comments. So, um, so this is going to be slightly different from our ordinary practice because Norm's going to uh, control his own cue. Um, but we'll be taking questions for about uh, half an hour. Yes. Can you tell me who you are also? Can you? Yeah. Francis Cam, professor of philosophy at Harvard and connected with the Safra Center. I, I just wanted to say one thing about the press. Um, many people think that PBS is an exception to the rule that you described. But I, I just have a personal story. It may not represent the way they always work, but uh, a philosopher, Peter Singer, uh, is in favor of rationing, and they wanted to have a program with an opponent. So they called me because Peter told them I was opposed to his views. And they asked me, um, 
whether I was opposed to Singer's views, I said yes. Was I opposed to rationing? I said no, not always. I just disagree with his principles. They said, sorry, we're not interested in you. We're looking for someone who's opposed to rationing. But I said, the intelligent ground is in the middle somewhere. Or in, we're not interested, sorry. So yeah. um, they are looking, well, in that case, this is just my example. I, it sounded yeah. like what, something that you mentioned. But you, you said that you were concerned that uh, parties were becoming parliamentary in a presidential system. But tribalism sounds much more than parliamentary. So uh, is it the case that we have not only a parliamentary party approach? Tribalism, uh, as you describe it, is more radical. If Obama, for example, were to agree now to not raising taxes on the rich and to raising money by fiddling around with the tax system, the tribalism message that you are promoting says that the Republicans would drop their support of, of that proposal. Is that extreme view the one you hold, that that would happen? Uh, I, I would say, first, I'm scared about that. Um, it is the case that you have, I think, a couple of groups within the Republican Party in Washington now. There are the ruthless pragmatists, that's the Mitch McConnells, who for the last four years was incredibly honest in a whole host of ways. It wasn't just the famous comment, my number one goal is to make Barack Obama a one-term president. It was also that uh, after the election, he was reflecting to a journalist and he said, well, of course we weren't gonna cooperate with him in the first uh, two years. Because if we had, we would have had some buy-in to it that would have legitimized those policies. They might have been popular, and he would have gained from them. So there's that. It's you know pragmatism. But the ruthless pragmatist, if it looks like you'll pay a political price for being obstructionist, is going to move off that ground. Best example is the payroll tax cut. Once the stakes got ratcheted up, and it looks like there'd be a price to be paid for blocking a tax cut for 98% of Americans, uh, they caved. But there's another group, which in the House is even larger this time. Now, the technical term would be lunatics. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, people who have extreme ideological views, and this includes those who were ready to go off the cliff uh, when it came to the debt limit. Um, and uh, they're not always smart, um, a, a former top Republican conservative congressional budget official was going around trying to convince Republicans before we hit the debt ceiling that this was a disastrous thing. And he had one of these members say to him, you know what, I'm gonna tell you what I'm convinced will happen if we breach the debt limit. America's credit rating will go up. And he said, do you know what a AAA rating is? There is no up. And he had no idea. So you've got that. Then you've got the people, um, the inaptly named Daniel Webster of Florida, who just won re-election, who blocked the funding for the American Community Survey of the Census, which is an absolutely critical set of surveys that business and local and state governments rely on for a whole host of decisions. And when asked why, he said, this is not a scientific survey. It's a random survey. Uh, you can see why he's not on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, but when you have people who, don't, who, who have those views, and now you've got a bunch of others who are saying, all right, let's go off uh, the cliff and let's let the debt limit go down and we'll show them who's boss, that you've got a problem, obviously. And what I fear is happening is that even the ruthless pragmatists are starting to lose ground. So there's that. And just one quick comment on, the, on PBS. And I think it's a problem that's affecting everybody. And some of it is, you know, we've had these well-established groups on the left and right ready to pounce any time they see signs of bias. Journalists hate it when they're accused of bias. Um, and now I think in a lot of places, they're a little worried about advertisers as well. There's not quite the Chinese wall uh, between the business and the, uh, and the uh, journalistic side. But that hits PBS as well. And I view this as being troublesome, not just because of the inability to hold people accountable. But if you come in using your example, and let me take another one, you're going to have a debate on climate change. And you've got 99% of scientists who hold one view. 
and 1% who hold the opposite view. And you could probably find that in the scientific community on any issue you wanted, maybe even whether the Earth is flat now. But you decide that in your debate, you're going to have one from each side. People watching are going to think that they're both equal. And it's not a surprise to me that we've seen over time some surveys that suggested, at least until recently, a decline in support for those who thought that there was a climate change problem. That's not a good way to have a dialogue. And if it begins to inflict the best of our media outlets, it's greater cause for concern. Yes. This works. Um, so I'm Jenny Pham Cantor. I'm a research fellow at the Safra Center. Two related questions. You've been pretty clear that uh, you blame the Republicans for a lot of the obstructionist um, behavior. But the first question is, um, these obstructionist Republicans are also being voted into office more frequently. May, yeah. One could argue, well, they're just reflecting the electorate's preferences. And I wonder how you might um, address sure. that. The second is that you blame a large part of it um, on money in politics, but it seems money in politics affects, uh, there's some symmetry there. It, it, yeah, I think Larry's made it pretty clear, affects both Democrats and Republicans. And I wonder, given the symmetry of that, why it disproportionately affects Republicans. Sure. Um, there are a couple of points on the first one, which is uh, voters don't decide who the candidates that they will be choosing from among happen to be, uh, not all the voters at least you're faced with a couple of choices. Many voters are completely disenfranchised from that choice. Others, for a variety of reasons, including indifference, don't turn out in low turnout primaries. But if you've got two choices, and one of those choices happens to be more extreme, for a variety of reasons, we're getting those candidates emerging, um, then you may not be reflecting a larger preference. And a part of it is we aren't reflecting that larger preference. And a part of it is the nature of the recruitment process. Let me put it in, uh, in other terms. It's a little simple to say, simplistic to say, but it really was the case when I first got to Washington that it wasn't uncommon to have the following set of circumstances. A group of leaders in a community would go to somebody, a lawyer, a teacher, a business person, and say, you know, we've watched you for a while, and you've really given a lot to the community. You're a sterling individual. Now it's time to give something back in terms of public service. We'd like you to run for Congress. And you'd get some of those people who would run and would win. Now imagine how it would work now. So the community leaders go to somebody and say, you know, we've been watching you for some time, and you're a sterling individual, and it's time to give something back to public service. And here's how it's going to work. The first thing that's going to happen is you've got to realize that the other side, your opponent and his or her uh, uh, supporters and acolytes, are going to be out there raising millions of dollars that will be dedicated to trashing the reputation that you have spent your entire career building. And they will dance a victory jig in the streets if your children come home from school crying, saying, we can't possibly go back to school because all my classmates do is trash you as being the worst vermin to hit the earth. And you'll be doing the same thing to protect yourself. But through all of that, you may win. And then you get to go to Washington. Except you're going to have to have your house back home, and you're going to be doing little except traveling back and forth. And when you get there, nothing much is going to happen. But every spare moment, since there isn't much legislating going on, you're going to be running off the hill to a safe house to do call time. Because now you've got to raise money for your own campaign. You've got to raise money for the team, for the tribe, but also you got to worry that some alien predator group, and you won't even know who they are, will parachute in behind your lines two weeks to go in the campaign when you can't possibly raise any money and spend millions of dollars in independent ads trashing you even more. So you'd better raise a protective amount just in case that happens. And then you'll win again and you got to go through it all over again. You've got to wonder why anybody in his or her right mind would do that now, and you treasure the people who genuinely are there to solve problems who happen to be there. But the whole incentive system has become tilted. So frankly, if you're on an ideological crusade, or if your ambitions are such that you figure, if I get there, I got a springboard to something that'll make me a whole lot more money or get me a, my own cable television show later on, it's not too difficult to find those people. That's a problem. It's also a problem that if you get good people running, 
it's very hard to win. And part of the reason it's hard to win is you've got a public, I believe, that can't figure any of this out. And so anybody who steps up and says, as they become more and more disillusioned with what's going on, I'm not like the rest of them. Herman Cain, I, I don't speak politician. They get traction. And what we're doing with that is even leeching out the politicians, which is what we want, like the framers, uh, and bringing in people who have simplistic solutions and who say, I know how to deal with this. I got the answers here. Never mind all this stuff. We draw the lines in the dust. It's black and white. It's simple. You cut spending. You cut taxes. Everything is fine. So it is a more complicated problem. There are ways of dealing with some of these things. There are ways of uh, diluting the impact of extremes in elections. I'd like to see, at a simple level, um, more use of the open primary system with preference voting. So you can keep third or fourth or fifth candidates from being spoilers, and also so that you can avoid the problem that we saw in one California district where you get a dozen candidates on one side and two on the other, and the dozen split it up and you end up with two, in this case it was two Republicans in a Democratic district um, where it didn't work the way one might have intended, uh, but it could happen the other way around as well. Um, and there are ways perhaps that we can deal with it in the money system as well. One of the ideas that actually came from a political scientist uh, in California named Sean Theriot, which I'm really getting to take to, is the creation of something that he would call we've got your back pack, which is a pack that would raise substantial sums of money that would go in to protect individuals who made courageous choices and did the right thing, wherever they happened to be, who then otherwise would face these terrible primary problems. And uh, you know that would be one small weapon to help on this front. But if otherwise, if you're a member who gravitates towards the middle, and you know the only place you're vulnerable is in a primary, and you know that you've got forces out there ready to spend millions to defeat you if you deviate from uh, the, the position, uh, the uh, litmus tests that exist out there, it's very difficult. It's no surprise to me that Joanne Emerson of Missouri, whose district in, uh, is centered around Cape Girardeau, famous as the home of Rush Limbaugh, um, but who's basically conservative, a real problem solver, who's been boxed in for the last few years, uh, announced today that she's resigning from the House. Uh, she's going to take a job running the Rural Electric Cooperative, but she's, you know, there's no point in being there if, one, you can't vote the way you want to, and if you do, you're a target. It's not good. Jim. Put, push the button, Jim. Sorry. Do I hold it down? Okay. Uh, Jim Snyder, a lab fellow here at the Cypher Center. Professor Lessig has suggested that the Constitutional Convention mechanism should be part of the discussion of solving political dysfunction in the United States. As you know, it's, uh, I would say it's been met with quite a bit of indifference in the political science community, and where there hasn't been indifference, I'd say mostly hostility. If you could give your own views about yeah. to what extent this might be a meaningful part of the discussion. And just to provide some context, if we were in this room in the 19th century discussing political dysfunction, our constitutional convention would have been a major part of the discussion. We've had 233 yeah. of them at the state level. That's the way people thought and conceived. And since that time, primarily in the last 50 years, there's been you know, an incredible sea change. Of course, there were no political scientists in the 19th century. It's a 20th century phenomenon. And I don't know why there's been such an incredible sea change. It's just never part of the discussion where it always was part of the discussion. And maybe you could provide some enlightenment yeah. about the change attitudes. Uh, I, I don't know about the latter, but uh, and you know, I do think, of course, one of the things we're also seeing is a rise in uh, the initiative and referendum process in places way beyond California now, too. And I think some of this is a response to frustration. Um, but what I also see is, uh, a process that is uh, filled with uh, dangers uh, far greater than uh, the potentially positive outcomes. And, uh, you know, uh, Republic Lost, I think, grapples with, in a very direct way, um, the pros and cons here and the problems. 
uh, I come down being a, a, a more nervous about the, uh, uh, the, the downside risk. And I worry now especially because I've seen, partly because of money, but also because of media, the ability of extreme forces to mobilize. And boy, would they mobilize for something like this. Um, and the possibility of getting a balanced budget amendment that I believe would be um, a surefire route to uh, regular depressions greater uh, than the 1930s. Uh, basically, if you take away the federal government's ability to do countercyclical policy, when states, the vast majority of which, some of because of constitutional conventions, have their own balanced budget amendments, it means that whenever you hit a downturn, they uh, provide enormous fiscal drag. Um, and it's like bleeding an anemic patient. And I don't know how many of you saw, if you haven't, uh, uh, go to YouTube. There was a wonderful Saturday Night Live skit that my friend Al Franken wrote, actually, called Theodoric, Barber of York, starring Steve Martin, uh, where he was the uh, physician in the uh, Middle Ages, and everybody who came to him, the solution was you bleed them. And the more he bled them, whether they had broken legs and arms severed or other problems, the paler they got, and so obviously they needed more bleeding. And then they would die. And at the end of it, he said, you know, maybe all of this is wrong. Maybe in some future generation, science will prove that this is an absolutely destructive thing to do. Nah. And then he went off. Um, well, if you don't allow the federal government to provide a counter to that fiscal drag, every time there's a downturn, you'll go right into the toilet. And I can see that being the first thing that comes forward. Tax limitation amendments even beyond that, uh, which are now uh, hamstringing Colorado even as they've uh, hamstrung uh, California. Um, not to mention very possibly crazy things in the political arena. So I worry about that. You know, if uh, the people in this room could be the delegates to a constitutional convention, um, fine. But when I think about uh, forces on uh, in both sides, but in particular now because of the mobilization that you could see from Fox News and talk radio all the way over to the Koch brothers who would be delighted to put five billion dollars into making sure that they could tilt the Constitutional Convention their way. It scares me a little bit. Uh, it scares me more than a little bit. So um, I, you know, I do believe that in the absence of a change in the Supreme Court, that the things that we want to do to deal with the campaign finance element of the money system, and keep in mind that's different from the larger question of what happens when somebody uh, making $50,000 a year as a staffer uh, is approached by a former colleague who's now making $350,000 a year as a lobbyist who comes in and says, you know, I've got my eye on you. Uh, we'd love to have you join us at some point. In the meantime, I've got this client who really wants to see your boss. And your response otherwise would be, get the hell out of my office. I'm not going to have that sleaze bag come in. And instead it's, well, I'm sure we can make time for it. Um, that sort of thing, uh, combined with um, the person who comes in and says, you know, I, I'm working with Americans for a better America. And, you know, they got more money than God, and they really want this amendment. And I don't know what they'll do if somebody doesn't support them, but $20 million in the final weeks of a campaign psh, wouldn't phase them at all. And they leave, and the member's thinking, that's just one little amendment. All of those things that happen, I don't know how you change it without the Supreme Court being changed. And it may be that the only way you can ultimately change it is through a constitutional amendment. And it may be that the only way you could get that done is through a convention. Uh, but I'm not yet at the point where I'm willing to take the risk. Yes. Hi, I'm Sharon Huckle. I'm a registered nurse from Boston. And um, what would you do about the filibuster? And uh, do you think it would be help if somebody in a powerful position created a clearer vision of good government and wise regulation? And Who would that be? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, in answer to the latter question. On the filibuster, um, I'll go back and just say, you know, it hasn't changed since 1975. 
The way it was changed in 1975 is interesting. Nelson Rockefeller was Vice President of the United States, and at the beginning of the Congress, he sent shockwaves. Nobody saw it coming. And he said uh, that uh, he ruled that the uh, Senate was not a continuing body, which meant that it could create new rules at the beginning of the new Congress by majority vote. Otherwise, what had been the underlying uh, principle of the Senate was because two-thirds of the members continue. They're not up for election. In theory, you, you can't have the uh, entire place uh, change from one election to the next. That its rules continued in place, and there was the catch-22 that the rules required two-thirds to overcome a filibuster if you wanted to change the rules. So he said it could be done by simple majority. And the Senate said, whoa, time out. And uh, the leaders got together. Robert Byrd uh, wanted to change the rules. And uh, the Republicans at that point did not want to have this principle done by their own vice president become institutionalized. So they compromised. And the compromise was they changed, uh, fundamentally, they changed the threshold uh, uh, of uh, overcoming the filibuster, invoking cloture from two-thirds of those present voting on bills or nominations, not on the uh, uh, rules changes themselves, down to three-fifths of the Senate. Uh, now, you could look at that and say, OK, so they've lowered the threshold. The fact is they created an enormous complication in this process. Because by making it three-fifths of the entire Senate, what they were doing was putting the burden on the majority to come up with 60 votes out of 100 if everybody was there. If it's present, a present and voting standard, let's say you decide that you're going to bring everything to a halt and go round the clock, then the minority has to stay there. They got to be very close by. Because otherwise, let's say they decide to go away for the weekend and keep just a couple of people on hand to block anything bad from happening and to force the majority to stay there by just saying there's no uh, uh, quorum here. Um, if they go away and there are 60 senators left, if it's a present and voting standard, two-thirds present and voting, 40 senators can invoke cloture and stop debate and keep it going. By moving that standard, it didn't have a huge impact. It helped a little bit for a short while. Um, but as the culture changed and the filibuster began to be used, not as it had usually been done in the past, rarely by a minority party or partisan or otherwise that felt intensely about an issue of some national significance, ready to sacrifice a lot to dramatize the issue and get the public on their side and mobilize, uh, but it became a weapon of obstruction. And it was, I lift my finger, I invoke a filibuster, I don't even have to be there, they've got to come up with 60 votes to overcome it, and if they do, I can soak up an enormous amount of time to get to that point, and then I've got 30 hours of debate afterwards, and I don't even have to be there to debate. I can just keep the 30 hours. So all of that changed, and now you either go back to a former practice where they don't do it on a regular basis, or you change the rule to bring it back to something close to what was the original practice. And how do you do that? If I had my druthers, there are a few principles. The first is, Right now, you can filibuster the motion to proceed to a bill. You can filibuster a bill. You can filibuster all the amendments. When they finally get a bill out, if they do, and it goes to a conference uh, committee and it comes back or the conference report, you can filibuster the conference report. You can actually filibuster the motion to create the conferees to go there. So one bite of the apple, simple principle, filibuster on the bill itself. Second, you streamline the process. No reason you should have 30 hours of debate afterwards. At minimum, you say 30 hours of debate, 15 on a side, so the majority doesn't have to use its 15 hours. And if you're going to debate, have that 15, you've got to be on the floor debating. And then I would do one more thing, which is to say instead of having 60 votes required to stop debate, you need 41 votes to continue to debate. So we had a few instances in the last Congress where the Democrats had to drag 92-year-old Robert Byrd out of his hospital bed to provide the 60th vote. And uh, other instances where you go from 60 to 59 because Ted Kennedy dies, and you, uh, even though you got 59 senators, you can't stop debate. So you have a cloture motion that passes on a majority 
unless you got 41 votes there uh, to oppose it. Force them to be the ones who have to provide all of the votes, the minority. It'll work on both sides. Uh, the problem now is, how do you do that? You can do it by uh, getting some bipartisan agreement. The bipartisan agreement comes if you accept what is a legitimate complaint of Republicans, which is to avoid some of the delays and also to avoid embarrassing amendments uh, or votes, the majority leader has used this practice that you're going to read about ad nauseum now of filling the tree, of basically using his power of recognition to block the minority from offering any amendments. And that has happened more than it has in the past. So you give them some amendments. And there's some sensible proposals. Carl Levin of Michigan has one that would allow the minority to offer amendments that are timely and, and relevant in return for making some of these other changes. And that you don't have to go to uh, the idea that it's a, a simple majority can do this. Or you do it on your own. But if you do it on your own, the Republicans have already said that we'll, they will go to DEFCON 1. And what you, if you know the Senate, you will know that there are multiple ways of bringing the place to a halt that go way beyond using a filibuster. Uh, if you deny unanimous consent to everything, you can uh, basically keep the place bottled up from acting at all. So it's not a desirable thing to do. And it's not clear that they're going to be able to do it because they've got 55 Democrats, but there are five, six, or seven more senior ones who are very reluctant to do these changes in this way. So I don't know. But what I do know is if the practice doesn't change, then the Senate becomes, uh, for a very long period of time, the most dysfunctional legislative body. And given the polarization in the House, that's saying something. Let's have one last question. Yeah. I'm Eric Beerbaum with the Software Ethics <clears throat> Center and the Department of Government. And one of the nice things about your book uh, is that you're very sensitive to unintended consequences of slight political tweaks. So you mentioned yeah. how with the C-SPAN camera being fixed on a member of Congress initially, that led to the exploitation of it uh, by, uh, such that you could claim the opposition party is not responding to me because the camera was not allowed to pan. Yeah. Um, and then that was changed uh, after months of abuse of that. And I wonder, in, even in the principles you just described, whether there's uh, similar kinds of unintended consequences that you might imagine. So one might be where um, uh, you can imagine a party using this tool, as you said, to shut down the Senate using mm -hmm. much more boring techniques than the filibuster. Uh, but requiring the physical presence, in particular, of a member, uh, combine that with C-SPAN and cable news. And can you imagine a scenario where we uh, create heroes out of those who um, you know, stay up all night uh, filibustering, yeah. and that it actually cycles out of control in ways that weren't possible back when Mr. Smith goes to Washington when that was in place. So is, is that a concern you have? Yeah, it, it, it is. Although, you know, of course, partly what's interesting here is that back in the 50s, when the filibusters that we know about uh, most, the civil rights ones occurred, the Southern Democrats wanted to bring the Senate to a halt and have it go round the clock because they wanted to debate. They wanted to show their constituents that they would do anything to preserve their way of life. And I remember uh, having a, a number of conversations with Strom Thurmond where he would go off uh, and talk at length about his famous 24-hour uh, record filibuster and about how uh, opponents would keep coming up to him and offering him orange juice or water and uh, how uh, he had to resist. And then he would uh, wink and say, of course, I had other ways of being able to stay on the floor for 24 hours. And I would say, enough, <laughs> too much information uh, here. Uh, and you just want to get out of the room anyhow. But um, that's different from what we have now. And what you have now is people who don't want their fingerprints over what's been going on. So you got to be, in all of these things, have a healthy skepticism. Structural reforms almost always bring unintended consequences. Sometimes they can be terribly negative, sometimes not. And another sense, healthy sense here, that our problems right now and the filibuster rule, I think, is a good example, uh, show that these are not just structural problems. Changing the structures doesn't automatically give you what you're looking for. If the culture 
is different. And a part of my deep concern now is I don't know how to change some of these elements in the culture. I mean, one of the things that we grapple with in the book actually is using public media to try and recreate a public square. Um, you can get very rosy and too rosy about the way it was when we grew up, um, where you had three networks and you know 90% of people got their news from a small number of sources and a couple of newspapers that were healthy in a city because you had a small group of, uh, of opinion leaders who decided what would be debated and there were some issues that were off the table entirely. But you had a public that shared a common set of facts and then you could get into the messy decisions and discussions and deliberation and debate over how you would resolve those. If you move to a world where you don't share a common set of facts, how can you even begin to have debates? And when you move to a world where not only do you have tribal media, but the amplification of the social media and emails, where you get these emails from your closest friends and relatives you know, that are forwarded to you, and they have automatic credibility because of where they're coming from, but they contain utter falsehoods. And I, you know, some of you, I'm sure, have had the same experience. I can't tell you how many smart people you know, forward these things to me and say, I never realized that this was the case that members of Congress get full pensions the day they enter office for the rest of their lives and have completely paid for gold-plated health care and their kids and their staffers get all their student loans forgiven and on and on and on. And I would write back and say, well, you know why you never realized it could be like that? Because it's a bunch of lies. And here's you know, what the fact checkers have said. The fact checkers do it one day and the email may you know, disappear for a few weeks and then it comes back and gets sent to another several million people and if people start to believe it nothing will shake them from that. I don't know how you deal with that in a world where in a world where all the financial models are there. If Rush Limbaugh tomorrow said you know I've changed my mind. Can't we all just get along? I mean actually I've taken a look and Barack Obama I may not agree with a lot of his things but this is a terrific guy, he's a patriotic American, he just wants to solve the problems and we can have a dialogue here. There goes $50 million a year because all the people listening to him are going to find someplace else giving them what they're looking for. And the same is true of Fox News. Change the message, two days later, Wolf News comes up, some other cable channel, maybe ESPN 32 becomes Wolf uh, News that has that message and two and a half million people gravitate uh, over there. So I'm not sure how you change some of that stuff. All I know is we do what we can do and you know we've got great ideas I think out there and I also think we have to starting with a president uh, being an opinion leader in these areas I really think we have to have a larger dialogue. I believe you have a country where the overwhelming majority of people don't know what's wrong but they know it's wrong. They know this is not the way it's supposed to be. And they know that if we continue down this road, we may be screwing ourselves and future generations. And getting them beyond the kind of focus that we get, even with books that sell a large number of copies but that hit only a sliver of people, and getting people to think about why having the six, not, you know, I don't worry about six billion dollars spent in an election. I worry about where that's coming from and what it's being leveraged for. But getting people to understand that this is a problem and it's not just a problem for us, it's a problem for them, that is critical in beginning to change things. And maybe over time you can nudge it away from uh, some of the pathologies in the culture and maybe you can even create some sense that if you lie, there's a price to be paid for it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Norm, uh, for an incredible lecture and uh, conversation that um, I know is a perfect way to end this term. I also want to mark this as another uh, in, uh, ending. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think she's gone off to take care of the next event, but um, uh, Jennifer Campbell, who has been with the center since I've come, um, has been in charge of these events, and as people who've been here throughout the three years recognize, these have been extraordinarily well orchestrated and managed events, and we are very grateful for her work. She is now moving on to other uh, even more profitable uh, uh, um, 
uh, circumstances, but um, I wanted to express on behalf of the center and all of us our gratitude to her for her work and ask you to join me in thanking her. Thank you. Thank you.